Now that we've reviewed a little bit about reference frames, let's apply reference frames to charges. So we are going to have two observers which each have their own reference frames. We have Alec and Brittany. Alec is going to define reference frame A, Brittany is going to define reference frame B. Now in this picture we show Brittany running, but again if, if it's easier you can think about Brittany being on a train. So Alec has established a magnetic field. He has put the world in a giant solenoid, for instance. So we're going to think about a simple, uniform magnetic field. And Brittany is holding a charge, like you do. So if Alec is at rest in his reference frame, remember that Brittany is also at rest in her reference frame. So this velocity represents the relative velocity between Brittany and Alec. So Brittany says, that her charge is stationary. So if I think about Brittany's frame, she says that the velocity of the charge equals zero. So what would she say is happening to the force? If she sees that there's a magnetic field, but that her charge is stationary, remember that the force from a uh, magnetic field on a charge is equal to Q V cross B. So if Brittany says, well, my charge isn't moving V equals zero, that should then say that the force is zero. But if we, instead we switch to Alex's reference frame, he says that there is a magnetic field, and so he would say that because VQ is not equal to zero, the force is not equal to zero. And in fact, if you do V cross B, V is to the right, the charge is positive, so, and the magnetic field is into the page, you get a force up. So it is easy to see why you would get a force up from Alec's point of view. However, all observers have to agree on the force. Why? Because if there's a force up, that means that the charge, for instance, would accelerate upwards, or Brittany would at least feel it pull upwards. Maybe she's holding it in place so that there's a force down from her arm. But the laws of physics need to at least overall predict the same events. Either, for instance, maybe there's a, a spring here. Either the spring stretches or it doesn't. And so if the charge acts as if there is no force on it, we need to give Alec a different explanation of what's happening. Because he created this magnetic field. Again, if you want, giant solenoid. And he sees that there's a charge and it's moving. So he would definitely say that there's a force. But why would Brittany see that force? Because she says, remember, that the velocity is zero. So we have to be able to fix this. Up till now, we've had this beautiful model of electric and magnetic fields. There have been effectively zero problems with it. This picture here basically breaks physics. This is really important. We have to come up with a means by which either Alex says there is no force, which it shouldn't matter if Brittany is carrying the charge or not. There's a charge and it's moving. So it seems like we have to fix Brittany's situation. And again, it isn't that Brittany can say that the force is zero. We would observe, for instance, that this accelerates or that the spring stretches or that there's a little sensor detecting a force. Both observers would agree on that. So what could cause a force on the charge from Brittany's point of view? Not a magnetic field, because remember that the magnetic field fundamentally depends on the velocity. And from Brittany's point of view, the velocity of the charge is zero. But what would cause a force upwards is an electric field. So this is the conclusion, that in Alex frame, there is a magnetic field only. So Alec has a B field, magnetic. Brittany has an electric field. Now she actually is also going to have a magnetic field most of the time, but we don't necessarily know, well, I mean, we'll know about it through calculations, but because that force is zero, because the velocity is zero, we're not talking initially about the magnetic field from Brittany's point of view. But 
there must be an electric field causing the force upwards on this charge. And based on that, based on knowing that this is a positive charge and the force is up, we see that the electric field then must be up, right? So we have that electric field everywhere. I'm not going to draw on top of Brittany out of respect. So we have this electric field, but Alec doesn't necessarily say that electric field is there because he sees this force being caused by the magnetic field. So Alec and Brittany don't agree on what fields are there. This is a pretty big deal. We have a force. Both of them agree on the force. Brittany says my force is due to an electric field. Alec says that force is due to a magnetic field. So this is what we end up with. In frame A, we have our force due purely to that magnetic field. In frame B, we have that force due to an electric field. Now again, there is a magnetic field in frame B. I see students make this mistake of thinking we only have a magnetic field and we only have an electric field. But it doesn't actually work that way. But since the velocity is zero, we don't have a force due to the magnetic field in frame B. So in this case, they both agree on the force. They don't agree on what fields are present. And remember that when we first were talking about fields, we inferred that they were there based on forces. So this is a little strange. This is definitely confusing. I think this is the hardest topic we cover in this entire class. But this is what is necessary to actually unbreak physics and have two observers in initial reference frames agree on the force. This is the only way to do it. So we come up with an equation for how to transform fields coming from this. I'm not going to do the derivation, but the book goes through it, and effectively you're just making these forces equal. And we have to alloc uh, allow for the fact that there could be uh, fields in, in both cases. We could have both types of fields in both situations. So notice here that we have the velocity of frame B with respect to A, and we're talking about the fields in A and getting the fields in B. So this is a case we have to think very carefully about which frame is which, because if you want to go backwards, you need to, for instance, flip the sign on this velocity. So we have an electric field in A, and again, in any case, these things could be zero, but our electric field in A is modified by the velocity cross B to tell you the electric field in B. Our magnetic field in B is again a modification based on velocity cross E, but we actually also have this co um, coefficient of 1 over the speed of light squared. So this is non-relativistic. The book starts to go through what we have to do if we want to think about the relativistic transformations, and we're just not going to worry about that. You shouldn't expect to be tested on that in any way. Uh, it's something that we can talk about in the, the next uh, class if you choose to take it. So remember that the subscripts here are denoting the frames. And again, if reference frames are confusing, there's the quick review video. And then there's actually content from the first uh, semester of this class, mechanics. So again, in a way, this is just going to be plug and chug. What's important is, again, to understand why we have to do this and kind of what the results are. So we can have a more complicated scenario where in frame A, we actually have both an electric field and a magnetic field. Note that in this situation, our electric field is not actually perpendicular to velocity. Our magnetic field is still perpendicular to velocity. So if we went through and thought about the force acting on this charge, we would have a force from the electric field and a force from V cross B. So we get this kind of angle here. So then if we're actually in frame B, notice that frame B is where the charged particle is at rest. In this case now, we have a force due to the electric field. Now, you can actually have a scenario uh, where the magnetic field would actually convert down to zero. Uh, but again, unless you have uh, exactly balanced your velocities and your field values, you might still have a magnetic field here. It's not necessarily zero. But in this case, you're, you're notice that your electric field is at a different direction 
than what your electric field was here because your electric field has to entirely give you the force which before had a component from magnetic field and a component from electric field. So this can get a little more uh, complicated than the original scenario with Alec and Brittany, but that equation will still work. So finally, the book kind of makes this interesting conclusion that if you go back to Faraday's law, this can actually explain a little bit what's happening. So in the laboratory frame, we say that our charged particles were moving when they were in our conductor, and therefore we get that, that force. In instead, the loop frame where our charged particles are not moving, there's now an electric field. We've transformed that magnetic field that was present here into now there being an electric field as well, and the electric field drives then the EMF in this part of the loop and therefore our current going around. So this transformation here actually fixes some things that we studied earlier that if you thought about them very, very carefully, um, wouldn't have actually made sense before. So this is just one example. Again, with this idea of doing the transformation uh, and now our fields changing, this actually fixes this as long as you make the relativistic corrections that we're not going to describe. So this largely works except for one uh, small, small detail which we're not going to worry about.